with Major Metcalf and Mrs. Boyle. They're chattering, Mrs. Boyle complaining, like always, of course. And Major Metcalf is very positive, very enthusiastic. He's like, oh, but she, Mrs. Ralston does this, and Mrs. Ralston does this, and the house has this. And man, it's just great. Everything's great. And of course, Mrs. Boyle's like, no, everything's terrible. I want my money back, basically. Um, but of course, she's not going to leave because it's they're snowed in. Um, they make it very clear that when you look out the window, the snow is all the way up to like halfway through the window, which means that it's it's a good five, six feet deep outside. They're not going anywhere. Nobody's going anywhere. Um, let's see. And then after the whole bickering, I guess you could say, between Mrs. Boyle and Major Metcalf, uh, Miss Casewell comes downstairs. This is a really funny instance in this section because Miss Casewell goes into the living room and turns on the radio and then she turns it up louder and louder and of course mrs boyle is like uh could you turn that down i'm trying to write here and she's like uh you could go to the writing room like get out of my face and of course mrs boyle's like Ugh, like i'm annoyed so she goes over to the writing room and miss casewell's like finally i got rid of her um and then christopher comes down and he tells miss casewell i swear this lady follows me everywhere talking about mrs boyle um talking about how obnoxious she is and how much he wishes she would just leave and miss casewell's like tactics right because of course she's going her plan is to annoy the crud out of mrs boyle until maybe hopefully she does leave or something happens who knows but at least she'll leave them alone all right and so this conversation between miss casewell and christopher is a very interesting one so christopher christopher talks a little bit about the weather talks a little bit just you know mundane little conversation um and miss casewell what does she say she says on page 31 um christopher says yes yes that's true snow's rather lovely isn't it so peaceful and pure it makes one forget things and then miss casewell says it doesn't make me forget and then he says how fierce you sound and she says i was thinking and he goes what sort of thinking and he sits on the window seat. She says, ice on a bedroom jug, chill blains raw and bleeding, one thin ragged blanket, a child shivering with cold and fear. And Christopher says, my dear, it sounds too, too grim. What is it, a novel? Miss Casewell says, you didn't know I was a writer, did you? And Christopher says, are you? And she says, sorry to disappoint, I'm not. So it's a really interesting like interaction between the two of them because she's... She's like real sullen. She's just like very, I, I guess we could say that she's kind of like bringing the mood down, so to speak. And she's talking about this child shivering in the cold and it's terrible and suffering. And then Christopher's like, oh my gosh, are you a writer? And she's like, nah, I'm not a writer. Just joking. Um, and so, of course, that conversation kind of ends. Molly comes down. Um, the phone rings. And this is a good shift in this piece of the play where the phone rings and it's the uh, superintendent Hogbin, which is the man in charge of the police station there uh, in their area. And he says that he's going to be sending a sergeant down. And of course, Molly's like, uh, he's never going to get through the snow. It's like, you know, five feet deep outside. And the su superintendent's like, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. And of course, Molly and Giles go back and forth and they're like, oh my gosh, what did we do? What didn't we do? <laughs> What's happening? And at this moment when... Miss Casewell hears Molly talking on the phone. It tell like the the small pieces, the um, stage directions, which are the italicized pieces. They says Miss Casewell lowers her magazine. She rises and crosses to the arch up left, right, and then as she a little bit farther down, as Giles and Molly are talking, it specifically says that Miss Casewell says, uh, "Trouble with the police, eh?" And then she exits left up the stairs, right. So it's kind of like, why are you worried? Like, what's happening? Like, what what are you what are you experiencing? So then, anyway, so they're going back and forth. Everything's fine. Giles and Molly are just like, might as well just deal with it. Whatever we did, we did, I guess. Um, Mrs. Boyle comes back and she starts complaining about the fact that the writing room is cold, and she's like, "I'm not paying you seven guineas a week just to keep like to make me freeze." And so, of course, Giles is like, "Okay, I'll go fix that. Thank you." Um, and then Mrs. Boyle and Molly start talking about Christopher Wren, um, Christopher, of course, and, um, Molly, Mrs. Boyle says, uh, I don't like him, and Molly's like, well, he's a, he's an architect, and of course Mrs. Boyle's like, well, of course I know that Christopher Wren is an architect, and she's like, no, no, this Christopher Wren is an architect, or at least he's going to be, um, 
And then, of course, Mrs. Bowes starts insulting her, and she's like, well, what kind of information do you know about these people? What do you even know about that foreigner? That's Mr. Potavicini, the one who showed up. And <laughs> Molly says, what about him? And she says, you weren't expecting him, were you? And Mrs. B or Molly says, to turn away a bona fide traveler is against the law, Mrs. Boyle. You should know that. And Mrs. Boyle says, why do you say that? And Molly says, Weren't you a magistrate sitting on the bench, Mrs. Boyle? So a magistrate is a judge. And so we find out right here that Molly actually knows Mrs. Boyle. And I don't know if that is going to matter, but I think you should probably write it down just for the sake of, like, we didn't think that Molly knew Mrs. Boyle until right this moment. She recognized her as a judge. Um, so I would write that down in your journal. Under Mrs. Boyle for a role in the story, Former judge, Molly knew her. Something like that. All right, so then we keep going. Mr. Potavicini comes into the room. Of course, he annoys Mrs. Boyle. Mrs. Boyle, like, leaves. She's like, forget you. I don't know. I don't like you. Potavicini starts talking to Molly, trying to give her advice, telling her you really should get some kind of, like, references for these people who are coming into your house. Uh, you don't know any of these people. You don't know anything about them. Uh, you could end up, you know, taking in somebody bad, right? You could take in a murderer, a thief, a robber is what he says, um, even a madman. And then, of course, Molly's like, oh my gosh, right? Like, because she's so naive, she doesn't understand. And then, let's see, I'm on page 37. Oh, this is where Molly, so Major Metcalf tells Molly, uh, your pipes are freezing. And Molly's like, oh my gosh, this and the police, and then of course Mrs. Boyle's like, the police! And then everybody who's there starts freaking out. They're like, oh my god, why are the police coming? What's happening? And of course Major Metcalf too, it's like, police? Did you say? Like, why are they coming? And here we get our last character. Suddenly, out of nowhere, somebody taps on the window. And we look over and it's Sergeant Trotter. And so he's the last character that you should put in your last box um, on your murder mystery journal in your murder mystery journal, whatever. Uh, so Sergeant Trotter is a young man, we're assuming in his 20s. He is, of course, the police escort, I guess you could say, that's been sent out to the um, to the Monkswell Manor. So of course, now he's here, he came on skis. So he just like skied in instead of having to drive a car. So that's, of course, how he got through that five feet of snow. Um, and he, uh, he's, they say he's got a slight Cockney accent, which is basically the farther north you go in England, the thicker their accent gets. And I mean, of course, you know what an English accent sounds like, right? A British accent. It's, it's very proper, but like the farther north you go, it's harder and harder to understand until you get to Scotland, which is when it's really hard to understand. Uh, so he's kind of like, he's just another like basic character that came into the story. Nothing, nothing exciting about him. Uh, he comes in and he stows away his skis and everybody's like, why is there a cop here? What's happening? And everybody's kind of suspicious. It's like, why are y'all worried? It's just the cop. It's okay. You'll be fine. Um, and then Christopher. Christopher starts to act a little um, questionable, I guess, when it comes to his sexuality. He's like, oh, who was that man? He was rather hearty, right? And then when the cop comes back in, he's like... He's very attractive, don't you think so? I always think that policemen are very attractive. So we kind of start to see a little bit of a shift in Christopher, but I do wonder if this is just like a ploy, right? Like, is Christopher just acting like this, or is he actually maybe gay? But we don't know. We just know that this is how he's acting. But up to this point, he hasn't said anything like this before. So we'll see. We'll see what he does. So now, of course, Giles, Mr. Major Metcalf, Christopher, Molly... They're all in, the, in Mr. Potavicini are all inside the living room and um, Sergeant Trotter comes in and uh, he sits at the table and he starts talking to them about what's going on. Um, of course, Molly's like, are we, have we done anything? And he's like, no, 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 it's nothing like that. I'm more here for like police protection. And she's like, protection from what? Um, and he says, it relates to the death of Mrs. Leon, Mrs. Maureen Leon of 24 Cold Street. We know that is our victim, right? The first person that we found out about in this entire story was Mrs. Leon. Um, so then Molly's like, yeah, of course we've heard about it. And, um, uh, he asks, Trotter asks, are any of you acquainted with her? Like, did any of you know her? And Giles is like, no, no, of course not. And so here's where we find out something interesting. Trotter says, you mayn't have known of her under the name of Leon. Leon wasn't her real name. 
She had a police record and her fingerprints were on the file, were on file, so we were able to identify her without difficulty. Her real name was Maureen Stanning. Her husband was a farmer, John Stanning, who resided at Long Ridge Farm not very far from here. And Giles is like, Long Ridge Farm? Wasn't that where those children... And he trotter says, yes, the Long Ridge Farm case. So now we have to pause. We know something more about our victim, and you need to go back in your murder mystery journal and write that down. You know something about her now. Her name was not Maureen Leon. Her name was Maureen Stanning. And we know that she was involved in some kind of case at the Long Ridge Farm. Something having to do with children. Of course, we're going to find out about that in just a minute. So Miss Casewell enters, and she's like, three children. So she knows something. She knows something about this case. Trotter says, that's right, miss, the Corrigans, two boys and a girl, brought before the court as in need of care and protection. A home was found for them with Mr. and Mrs. Stanning at Longridge Farm. One of the children subsequently died as the result of criminal neglect and persistent ill treatment. Case made a bit of a sensation at the time. So now we know why Mrs. Maureen, or at least we know possibly why Mrs. Maureen would have died, because she was involved in a case where three children were abused and one of them died. So that's a big deal, right? So this wasn't an act of just attack for no reason. It wasn't in cold blood. It was done for a reason. She was involved in something ugly. Um, and of these three children, one of them died. And so now we're going to move forward on page 41, of course. Trotter says the Stannings were sentenced to terms of imprisonment. Stanning died in prison, so that's Mr. Stanning. And Mrs. Stanning served her sentence and was duly released. Yesterday, as I say, she was found strangled at 24 Culver Street. Um, Molly said, who did it? Of course, right? You know, um, and he says, I'm coming to that, madam. A notebook was picked up near the scene of the crime. We have more evidence. Put that in your murder mystery journal under Mrs. Uh, under victims. Evidence. We have an evidence. It's a notebook with two addresses. One was 24 Culver Street and the other was Monkswell Manor. And of course, Giles is freaking out. And Trotter's like, yes, yes, this is, I know, I know. So uh, the superintendent decided to send me here um, to see if I could find anything that connected the Monkswell Manor and Long Ridge Farm, especially since Long Ridge Farm, where the child, where the child had died, um, was so close to Monkswell Manor. <clears throat> and Giles is like, it must be a coincidence. There's nothing here. Like, we have no connection to them. And Trotter's like, the sergeant or the superintendent doesn't really think that it's a coincidence. Um, and he says he'd have come himself. It, it, there's something specific here, and I want you to remember this. Major Metcalf turns and looks at Trotter during the next speeches and takes out his pipe and fills it. As Trotter tells him that the superintendent would have come himself if he had had any way possible to do it, but under the weather conditions, and as Sergeant Trotter can ski, he was given the instructions to go down there and gather all the particulars from everybody who lived in the house, or at least was staying in the house. And of course, that is how that section ended. So right now, we've got a lot going on. We, we know a lot is happening, and we know that something is coming, let's put it that way. And so, of course, Trotter's going to have to start interviewing everybody. We've got more evidence. We've learned some uh, more details about the character specifically. We kind of see Miss Casewell being a little suspicious. Um... Major Metcalf is kind of giving a little extra attention to things when he hasn't really before. Remember, Major Metcalf up to this point has been pretty bland, um, but he's been giving some extra attention as well. So I want you guys to read the next part of the story, which is going to end Act 1, Scene 2, and then uh, you guys will have an assignment to work on at the end of it, okay? So that's it for me today.